As Trish says, my name's Dole and this is Al. Um, I've been teaching for about five years, Al for about three. And um, we're both business teachers, we're both course managers, and I guess now researchers, um, which still seems quite, quite different. I mean, a year ago, I would never have classed myself as a researcher, and I guess Al probably, probably the same. Um, this is our title, How Sensitive Do You Need To Be? It kind of um, came about in a very kind of backwards way. Um, there's a paper by Wood and Middleton in 1975. It's a long, long time ago, but it's one paper that kind of resonated a lot with us. And it's about the region of sensitivity, and it's what we're going to touch on um, a little bit later. But before we do that, um, we've got a couple of images that kind of encapsulate kind of the journey we've been on, really. And it's the word that's cropped up throughout the whole day. And um, you hear the word journey, and at the very start of my RDF and our RDF uh, journey, it, it sounded a bit cliche. It sounded a bit fluffy, and it sounded a bit in my mind. And, that's, and I couldn't be more wrong, honestly, I could not be more wrong, because it has been a journey. Um, this is probably our 16th or 17th title, give or take. Um, we've literally, we've not, we've flipped the class, we've flipped our research from looking at technology to actually look at um, teaching and the purpose of teaching. Um, before we entered onto this programme, we were, we were really lucky. At a previous college, we worked with um, a PhD <coughs> student of uh, Sugata Mitra. Some of you might have heard of him. He uh, won the TED Prize a few years back. He uh, developed self-organised learning environments, so using the internet as a means of collaboration. And we were really lucky to work with this PhD student and look at um, how the internet's changed, how we learn and how we teach. Brilliant opportunity. Um, and thinking about what Feltag have been saying and what the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills have been saying, we thought, right, so technology is definitely the answer. Technology solves everything. And that's not to say, I'm not knocking technology because technology is, is really important. You know, we were talking about Facebook and how and that can be used in the classroom, but it's using it in the right way. And I think that's where our research started to change, I think. Yeah, and that was, that was largely attributable to Maggie on say, when we sat down there after we talked, said, yeah, technology, 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 with new, new lecturers coming into the new college, we thought, right, uh, the new college staff down to work out now, they didn't really, there wasn't a great deal of technology, so they didn't really use it much. A lot of the systems were outdated, the software, the hardware wasn't particularly up to scratch. And I don't know whether that played a part as well, but we found, or certainly I did, I may speak for Dom as well, we found our own practice was changing. So we were used to having the luxury of smart boards and everyone had a computer and a tablet to actually back to basics, tables, flip chart pad, which was quite rare. Okay, trying to get your hands on that <laughs> and stash it underneath the desk. Um, so that's that sort of that sort of shaped us a bit there. We've got a couple of uh, quotes here. So where's the evidence that technology actually benefits the students? Okay. Yes, um, we were talking about delivering outstanding Austin lessons, yeah, and often doing the same things. You roll out your bit of tech, you roll out this, that and the other. Okay, but does it actually enhance the student experience? Um, I've seen it about on some of the posters, a couple of people quoting Laura Lara as well, um, saying yes, technology is great, but it has to be grounded in educational theory first. <coughs> so we've got here, um, this is sort of how we got to our sort of title of question, so what, what is the actual role of the facilitator now, of the, of the lecturer? Um, we talked about journey, journey, journey. Ours has been a bit of an adventure, actually. Um, we've, got, we've got a plane there. Basically, we're, so we're based in Portsmouth. So for our residentials, it would start at, I don't know, 5M five, five alarm, cab to Southampton Airport, get the, get the plane, metro the other side for an hour to Sunderland, and then about a 25-minute walk. It was, it, was, it was fun, to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, first... 15 minutes. Yeah, well, we were... <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, but anyway, we would have thought that process would have got a lot easier. We encountered more and more problems as we went along. So first journey, great, okay, although we were half hour early at the airport, so we were outside in the cold and wet waiting for the airport to open. Not a problem. Se second time, we were a little bit more confident with, with what we were doing. We stopped off in Newcastle for uh, a bit of shopping. Um, literally, we were seconds away from missing our flight. Okay? I've never been so scared in my life. When you get on that, and I don't know if you've done it, when you get on that plane, everyone stares at you, it's horrible. <laughs> Third, and you know, three times we've done this journey now, this must be the easiest, no, absolutely not. Our plane got cancelled, we had to go to Luton, and had a wedding to get to, so we had a £150 taxi ride to make the wedding. Okay, so journey, but I would say more of an adventure. Um, 
And so what, what we, came, we came up with, as, as for each residential and discussing on the planes and on our long taxi journeys, um, what do we want to look at? And so we actually started to think about, so what does the lecturer do? What is the point in lecturing? What is the point in having someone in the room to facilitate learning? And that's not to knock technology. I mean, some of you were taking photos with your phone because that's better. I haven't got a chalkboard here because that's better. And um, I think Norm was using YouTube because that's better than a VHS recorder. That's kind of the, the mindset we took with this project. Um, so how sensitive do you need to be? What is the role of facilitator in a 21st century FE business classroom? That's what we kind of chiselled down the title to after God knows how many changes. Um, so what we did, um, we looked at using a mix of methods of observations and interviews, very semi-structured, and we wanted to get the lecturers to actually talk to us about what they see their role as. Um, because what we think is, is a lecture might be very different to what other people think. We wanted to allow them the, kind of the opportunity to talk about it. Um, we observed four different lecturers, so some experienced, some inexperienced, and that's in terms of how long they've been teaching, not their age, which I thought was, was quite important, and actually talked to some students as well to see well, what do the students see as the role of the lecturer, because arguably that's just as important, isn't it, really? We can think of ourselves as an part of knowledge or facilitator, but if the students see us as the opposite, then we're, we're, kind of, we're not mapping together. So this was our time scale. Um, to say it was fluid is uh, an understatement. Uh, we tried to keep to it as much as possible. Um, it's, it's worked to an extent, but I think the same thing with probably a lot of you, it's actually created more questions and answers than when we started, which whether that's a good thing or not, but it is, is in a way quite frustrating. Um, so what we did, we, um, we looked at the research around um, lecturing, around teaching, and again, the one that really resonated with us was Wood and Middleton, and he talks about this, um, this gap, this recognition production gap between um, what the uh, student can do and what we perceive the student is able to do. And of course we think of Vygotsky and ZPD, etc. But actually taking it that step further and how does the lecturer understand this gap exists? Because it's all in a good sound that okay, yeah, there's, there's obviously a gap between what someone can do and what someone can do with someone else. But how does the lecturer see when to help, when not to help? Because that's the hard thing, isn't it? I think as lecturers we, we sometimes want to help too much when it's better to step back. And actually trying to get lecturers' opinions on this was really important. Um, Buddy was talking about um, Biesta and um, looking at how it's, it's the qualification is massively important, but I don't know, I, from, from my personal opinion and a lot of the lecturers, it's the socialisation and I think it's the uh, subjectification, but yeah, subjectification. So actually making people autonomous, um, making people, the quote in our, in our paper is normal human beings, which I thought was quite, quite funny because you have students and we've been speaking to um, employment advisory boards and they, they, you know, employers can teach students their skill. What they can't teach them is to not get that phone out in a meeting sometimes, or to turn up on time, or how to dress. It sounds so silly, but employers are still wanting this. So actually getting that from employers and from lecturers is really, really powerful. Um, we did look at technology, again, so we did look at Cigar to Meet self-organised learning environments, and we did speak to lecturers about how they use technology. You know, we all probably know Prensky talking about digital natives, digital immigrants, but that was a long time ago, <coughs> and I think Technology, like I keep saying, is so important, but it has to have a means to an end, it has to have a point. So, um, what we found out, we found out a lot. Um, when lecturers were asked what's their role, we started off this discussion about added value, and then not necessarily added value, but adding value. So it's not necessarily a score, and it's not a line, it's not a chart. It's okay, they started at this point, and they finished at that point. Fine, they did, we didn't necessarily add value in terms of the numbers, but they can now present it in front of a class, or they now have to know how to search for a job. And that's what the lecturers were feeding back to us about what was so important, actually um, making a difference to the students, making a difference to where they want to be in the future. I think, that, um, I think Norman, you were talking about that earlier, about lecturers and how they, um, their perception of teachers, how they want to make a difference, they want to improve people. And that, that really came through with, with our interviews as well. Um, we did. We spent a lot of time talking about qualitative and quantitative measures when we were up in Sunderland and um, just the, the type of study, the way we went in the end, we, we couldn't think, we tried hard and hard, but we just couldn't think of a way to quantify any of the data. So it's all, it's all qualitative, so we haven't got any nice graphs um, like you have to, to borrow something else for next time. Um, I just want to read you a little bit. This is, this is um, a short case study from one of the lecturers, so I won't read the whole thing, but I'll try and read snippets that I think are quite powerful. Um, when I'm talking to students, I'm always trying to get them to work as hard as possible. This applies to both getting them to think as well as them actually doing things. 
That's when I ask them questions. I try to ask them questions that need to stretch themselves in order to get the answer. Every so often they'll say, I don't know, and I'll try to get them to work a bit to get the answer. I'm trying to get them used to the notion that it's achievable if they put the effort in. Uh, as for dealing differently with different students, I find that whereas some willingly work hard, others haven't grasped that hard work gets results. For those who can't see the point of hard work, it is invariably because they lack confidence. So with those learners, I feel it's my role to build their esteem, maybe by making it easier before trying to stretch them. And I think that, that encapsulates a lot of, we talk about scaffolding, we talk about um, that recognition production gap, and this here is, is a real kind of example of that, that in place. Um, just, just, just one of the one of the final key findings was that we found that um, we talk to lecturers and yes, they know what they here. They know these different sort of learning theories, but or know all of them, but don't don't think they use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, we're fortunate that we don't have to do we don't have the like, official lesson plans where we are now. But um, you still want to do a mental one. But a lot of them, a lot of the lecturers work will, will never think about what got you on writing a lesson plan or when I'm delivering a session. However, some of the, you know, when we went through, we had discussions, we talked about it, it was apparent, actually, you are doing it. You just don't signpost it, type thing, or don't realise you're doing it, sort of in, in, instinctively. Yeah, and I mean, it's, and the, in, the, sorry, the inexperienced lecturers wanted to know, well, how do you know when to help? You know, this, this idea of intuition, um, and how, how do you know as an experienced teacher when to step back or when to step forward? And that was something that the inexperienced, I don't know the word now, but inexperienced teachers were saying, well, we need more guidance on that. And this kind of led us to um, the next stage, really, because thinking about CPD and thinking about how um, a lot of our CPD sessions, whilst they're, whilst they're great, are very focused on technology, which again is useful, but I think it's, whether it's government driven or whether it's college driven, we're not really sure, but it's, sometimes there's too much of a push. And one of the things that we found and speaking to a lot of the lecturers was, you know, let's actually look at traditional theories and see whether traditional theories and approaches to teaching and learning have a place and maybe we can actually incorporate that into CPD. And I know we've only spoke to say four lecturers and some students, um, but it seems there is a demand for that. So actually, I think this is what a lot of different posters and a lot of different people are saying, actually allowing either small groups within a college or the college itself to take ownership of your CPD. If there is a demand, then well, let's, let's meet the demand. It's demand and supply, isn't it? So let's actually be able to do that within a CPD focus. Exactly. Yeah, we'll just go through. So, in terms of in terms of outcome, um, we've been asked to, to support the college. You know, talk about the CPD space and having time and, and support. Um, the college is committed, the principal is committed to giving us the space uh, while teaching and learning. And we're sort of piggybacking off the back of that. Then she's asked us to um, help design and have an input in, in this space for lecturers. Um, originally, it was very, very techy techy, and now so we've got a little library there. We've with books in, <laughs> so going back to the going back to the sort of older older schools, it were. So that's one of the things that we're working on right now. So that's a really sort of positive, we think, outcome from, from what we've done so far. I think the big recommendation is um, it, it, it never started off as a CPD project, but it has ended up kind of again falling in that path, having teachers take ownership of their CPD. And in this example, it's well, what place does traditional methods of teaching and learning have in CPD? And not just that, for me, it's it's those, how do the new students, the PGC students, see when you're bridging that gap or when you're making it too far and how do they see those indicators and how can we interpret that and how can we bring that into CPD is what, is what we want to do. I think that's pretty much it, so thank you very much for listening.